This week on the program, the ongoing legal battle between slimming product Herbex and the Advertising Standards Authority comes to a head. We'll ask if South Africa can really successfully rebrand itself. More about a movement set to tap into the renewed sense of hope and optimism currently being shared among South Africans. And we'll take a look at an award-winning advertising campaign that sees tourists taking a pledge to protect and respect the natural resources of a tiny island nation. Very warm welcome. Now, any effort, says our first guest, to rebrand South Africa should begin at the domestic level to galvanize a new national consciousness about who we are, what values we share, and what goals we aspire to achieve as a nation. Professor Mzukuzi Kobo is chair of African Diplomacy and Foreign Policy at the University of Johannesburg and writes that rebuilding the country's credibility and convincing investors that we're open for business is going to be a tough act to perform, particularly since we are still, he says, in a transition phase between the fall of Jacob Zuma and the general election in less than 18 months' time. Professor, a very warm welcome to you. Before we get to the premise of your Thank argument. You. How would you define South Africa's brand standing right now? South Africa's brand currently is uh, in threadbare. Uh, it's, it's been tattered uh, during the last decade of the Zuma years. Uh, I think South Africa went through a transformation of sort during that period. The kind of projection that it had as a credible uh, and respectable international player all went under during that, that time. So we, we have a, an uphill battle to rebuild that, that brand. But you also have a degree of optimism that this is a brand that can be rebuilt if the right metrics are put in place. Certainly, I mm -hmm. think uh, what we should avoid uh, as much as possible is uh, doing all these marketing uh, gimmicks and uh, sending people abroad to do uh, road shows and, and that kind of thing without grounding those activities at the domestic institutional level to have a conversation amongst ourselves as South Africans regarding who we are. But don't we have an not? obligation to do both? So we need to get things right at home, but surely we need to be telling, <clears throat> for want of a better word, our customers abroad that we are doing something. We certainly have to be doing yeah. that. Uh, so we can't tell our customers that, that we're doing something. It's low. We don't, yeah. we don't have an economic recovery plan. There is no framework uh, to reshape institutions, to fix governance, and to hold the necessary conversations that we, we should hold as South Africans on a way forward. Yes, it's not either or, but the primacy uh, in my argument should be on the domestic plane. So you begin at the domestic level, you also talk about galvanizing a new national consciousness. What is the national consciousness and how do you galvanize it? A great question, Jeremy. I, I think uh, South Africa, the public mood in South Africa um, in the past 10 years has been very low. I think psychologically we are somewhat damaged as, as a country as a result of this nightmare uh, that we, 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 we slept through during Zumaez. And I think you begin, you begin to see in certain parts of our conversations that we are in an, a low intensity warfare. We are unable to hold civil and productive conversations about race, about identity, about shared objectives on inclusive growth, about redistribution, about what kind of value system we want to cultivate as a nation. And leadership plays uh, a powerful and courage role in catalyzing those conversations. So what type of leadership are we talking about? And I wonder if that leadership needs to implement a radical intervention, given to your point that there is so much residual anger that exists right now and so many unresolved issues? Certainly, um, I think Ramaphosa is highly promising. I think his emergence already lifted the national mood. It's not enough. But we have, it's not enough, mm. exactly. We do need to understand that uh, he is not a savior. He is not a messiah. Uh, he has constraints within his party and, and most importantly, he will need to build a team around, a formidable team around himself. Which he has started to do. 
which he has started to do, uh, not by any stretch sufficiently, because if you look at the cabinet that he has, it's a hodgepodge of loyalists of Jacob Zuma, uh, people who were uh, serial underperformers, and, and some people that he has handpicked. But he also has to understand that that is tempered by political realism, though. It is not I mean, for it is not it's, for it's us. It's a balance between the two, isn't it? It, it is yeah. not for yeah. us to rationalize for him that we expect leaders to rise, we expect leaders to solve difficult problems, we expect leaders to be bold and decisive and to face down their parties. So we shouldn't do rationalization for <laughs> Cyril Ramaphosa. You raised one interesting point, and maybe we were going back to the to the Mandela years, um, yes. is that we often are seduced as, as, as South Africans by this Messiah complex. Yes. And that was certainly the case with, with Nelson Mandela, maybe to a lesser extent with the economic realism of President Mbeki. But we need to be cautious of, of of putting all our eggs into one basket of belief, I imagine. Yes, uh, Jeremy, I think there are three things that are important. One is um, a very clear outline of goals and a sense of milestones that we want to move through as, as a nation to. There has to be a clear execution strategy that we, we are implementing uh, policy innovations, because one of the weaknesses in the last 10 years has been implementation deficit. And, and finally, we do need symbolism. I think it's good to have uh, leaders that are idealistic. With Mandela, there was a, an emphasis on normative values, uh, nation building, reconciliation, Tabombeki, African renaissance, economic recovery, uh, building institutions. Ramaphosa has to express his own imprimatur as, as, a, as a president, so as a leader. The final question to you, if you were the minister of brand South Africa. Let's assume that there's a new portfolio. It's not going to happen because the cabinet's being slimmed down. Yes. But let's assume, <laughs> what, what would the short-term goals be that you might set in order to achieve at least a first step on the rung of this ladder? The first goal uh, to do that, because everything that we do is read internationally, is, is, is watched interna internationally, is to move very fast in rebuilding institutions, uh, is to uh, match words with uh, action. Uh, so rebuilding it, institutions is would be principally state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises, yeah. cutting down the cabinet significantly yeah. because the cabinet is not big yeah. uh, by because it has to be so, but it was to feed cronies. Uh, scale down on our international missions, uh, our embassies, and be seen to, uh, to be taking decisive steps on mm -hmm. corruption and have an economic recovery plan that is much more coherent and, and more long-term than the 10-point plan. Appreciate the wise words. Let's come back and visit. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I would love to do that. Yeah, have well, a wonderful day. Talking about country branding, here's a fascinating story. The island nation of Palau is the first country on earth to change its immigration laws for the cause of environmental protection. Upon entry, visitors now need to sign a passport pledge to act in an ecologically responsible way when <laughs> visiting the island. The campaign was recently awarded a coveted black pencil at the prestigious DNAD Awards in the United States. Human impact on Earth's environment is one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. The small island nation of Palau in the Pacific Ocean was feeling these impacts acutely. Tourists were damaging reefs, littering oceans and poaching protected species, their careless behaviour magnified by large numbers. But how could a small local population with limited resources police the high volume of visitors? What if we made the tourists police themselves? Introducing the Palau Pledge, a first-of-its-kind immigration policy for good. All visitors now need to sign an environmental pledge to gain admittance into Palau. Stamped into the passport of international arrivals, the pledge is a formal promise to Palau's children. Children of Palau. I take this pledge. To preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. To implement this policy, government, the tourist industry and citizens were brought together. A new visa entry step was designed and issued in multiple languages, and immigration processes were changed. The jolt that comes with the pledge is the recognition that, hey, I can make a difference. But we didn't stop at the passport step. We redesigned the tourism experience, ensuring tourists and locals were empowered via a website, a compulsory in-flight film, a passport insert, collateral, and signage and penalties for bad behavior. Launched at the UN, the Palau Pledge has been praised by international leaders and groups. 
Influencers helped inspire people to take the pledge online in solidarity with Palau. The Palau Pledge has raised global awareness of the responsibility this generation has to the next. But its biggest impact is local in Palau. I hope my children can see the beautiful place one day as I see today. Next on Mags on Media, a legal perspective on the drawn-out false advertising case between the Advertising Standards Authority and the slimming product Herbex.